from Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead. Here's a DogNation.com insider. Well, hello to John Stinchcomb here, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Man, John, so much to get into with you. Um, you know, I've been doing more of the MIM stuff on the show. We got to get to the Clay Webb part of this there as well, but let me just start with the MIMS thing here first, and we'll go big picture and see where the conversation takes us. Marius MIMS into the transfer portal, former five star who may be going to find out, or at least, you know, uh, try, try to find out if the grass truly is greener somewhere else other than UGA. What do you think the, of, of the MIMS news as it's been reported that he's maybe on his way out here of the University of Georgia? Well, it's frustrating. It, it's a little bit disheartening for, for Georgia fans. It's also encouraging. It means that uh, Broderick Jones and Warren McClendon are playing at a level that uh, Amarius Mims is looking at this and going, there's not a clear shot for me to crack the starting lineup at my natural position at tackle. It also probably means that um, either it wasn't a great fit in, in the interior at a guard position or that the other players that are in competition for those spots are playing at a level at which Marius is going, maybe there's there's better opportunity for me. Uh, the way I read it, he, he probably comes into college, five-star guy. He's been told by everyone and their brother that he's on a three-year plan. And uh, in three years, at the end of that season, he's going to be heading to the NFL and going to become a professional football player. So if you're looking at year two and you're saying there's not that availability that I was anticipating and uh, that, that – two tackles that are, are filling the spots that I'm competing for um, aren't, aren't walking out the door at the end of this year either, that there's probably a better opportunity for me to execute on the plan that I had uh, a year and a half ago when I signed on the dotted line to, to come to Georgia. You're looking at uh, Salyer is on his way out, and that maybe that's a spot that I can easily fill. I'm sure that was part of the recruiting process for him. Um, but... I think for Georgia fans, you look at it and you go uh, a month ago, including Owen Condon and, and with uh, Drew Bobo coming to town over the summer, you had over 21, I think it was 21 offensive linemen on scholarship um, when it, it, that, those numbers just aren't going to add up. It, I think everyone looked at, at that position group specifically and said there's going to be attrition. Um, from National Signing Day to uh, that that start of training camp, there will be some change. There will be some turnover. Uh, it, 21 guys in a, in a specific, specific position group just doesn't seem realistic when um, your numbers still aren't under, what is it, 85 or 86, whatever it needs to be uh, by the summer. So I think we all realize and recognize that there is going to be players to walk away. Condon being the first looks like uh, Clay Webb and, and Mims are the next dominoes to fall. And yeah, it's unfortunate because I think Amarius Mims, just from the limited uh, opportunities that he had this past year, that he's going to be a really, really good player. Uh, he certainly has the frame. He has the tenacity. Uh, I remember breaking down his film on this show with you yeah. uh, last year and, and, and talking about uh, the tight player he is and the assets that he has. Um, so it's, you know, I, it's unfortunate for Georgia uh, that you lose a player of his caliber. But um, with that said, you know, the, the way the game is being played right now, and I'm talking about more than just uh, between the sidelines, um, especially in this off season, that the transfer portal is, is a very real opportunity for a lot of these guys to see uh, if there's there's a better, uh, quicker fix for them to address any of the issues that they might have in their program. Yeah, I want to deal with a lot of that because I think that's a, a, a lot of you know very good stuff. First of all, on the idea of you know Mims and what his you know prospects could, could have been for this upcoming year had he stayed at Georgia. You know, I'd said many times that, hey, I like the idea of a best five for UGA that includes Mims, maybe playing the guard spot. And I'll admit to be ignorant of what I speak about here, John. I'm going to oversimplify this to make the point that as a fan, a guy who watches these games from inside the stadium or on TV, I've largely operated on the assumption that, hey, not every guard could be a tackle, but maybe every tackle could be a guard. That, hey, just throw Mims out there to a guard spot and let him you know, do his thing because he's so talented. Uh, we've seen like a guy like Evan Neal kind of do that thing for Alabama, who's on his way to being a very high first-round pick at the tackle spot, but also played some guard for the Crimson Tide. 
is that a gross oversimplification that a guy like Mims, who is more naturally a tackle, that you know you can't just necessarily throw him out there at guard just because he's a he's a you know a potential talent. There is a level of technique there that that it requires you to know a little bit about playing the interior offensive line position. There, I mean, how easy would it have been for Georgia to take? the more obvious tackle Mims and just kind of throw him out there in the guard spot just to give him a chance to play somewhere. You know, how easy or not easy would that have been? Well, I think Evan Neal's a great example because both guys are, you know, your six, seven, six, eight range, not your typical guard, but Georgia has, has utilized a player of that same build or, or type in Ben Cleveland, uh, you know, who came out of high school is probably projected more as a tackle than he was a guard. Uh, but because of his flexibility and his opportunities and his skill set, was able to very quickly assimilate into that guard position and, and never really came back up to the outside. And, you know, I think it's a player by player um, analysis that you have to make. Uh, you know, Salyer is a guy that I think most people would say is, is more proficient at guard, but yet had the ability to slide out the tackle and did so at a very high level. Uh, playing left tackle until a you know, national championship game where you need to make a change. And all of a sudden, because of his flexibility, he's able to move to the inside. You've got a guy like Roderick Jones that can step in, and there's not much of a drop-off. So when you have that versatility, um, it allows you to keep that best five mentality as a as a coaching staff. And, you know, if, if Mims, is one of the best five and you've already got two tackles that have pretty much uh, cemented themselves in the starting positions on both sides of the ball, then absolutely you give him the chance to compete at the, at one of those interior spots, which I'm sure was part of that discussion. Uh, or, you know, as, as these coaches are looking through and combing through uh, the transfer portal for what can help them. Uh, part of that assessment is, understanding the mentality of the guys in your own locker room. And um, if you've got talent, and Amarius Mims is, is certainly falls into that category, you're trying to figure out ways um, to keep him in-house. You don't want to lose a guy of, of uh, his talent level. Um, and, and so if that's – can we give him some opportunities at guard that both helps the team and uh, gives us more opportunities and, and options down the road – because um, Lord knows injuries happen all the time, then then you were, you're going to try to take advantage of that. So, you know, it, it's this isn't a, a new concept, a novel idea that coaches should look at players at, at different positions um, for for a number of reasons, and I'm sure that was explored with men. So let me also bring up something else you mentioned before too. It's like we're in the age of transfer portal now, the age of NIL, and there's all these like new things that coaches are forced to deal with, which leads to the obvious question of, okay, well, how much then does a program like Georgia, coach like Kirby, need to change with the times, you know, in terms of what you're asking from players these days? And, John, I don't mind telling you, and maybe I'm old fashioned. I'm sure you're probably kind of, you know, closely aligned with me on this, but nonetheless, we'll have the conversation of, if you want to play at the national championship level, I don't think you can change too much. I mean, look at Kentucky basketball. They're number one, number two in recruiting each and every year. They're a factory of future NBA players, but they're not winning anything right now. They, you know, they're, they're getting beat by St. Peter's in the first round of the NCAA tournament. That that you have to ask something of the elite talent that comes in your program if you want to be yourself an elite program, if you want to be winning games, competing for championships, things like that. So you can't do it without elite players or elite, you know, elite prospects, but you are going to have to continue to to work to develop them, continue to to you know, ask big things from them to challenge them. If you want to be as as good as you uh, want to be, you know, if you want to, if, if you acquiesce too much to whatever you know modern demands the elite prospect has, I don't know that you're in a national championship level you know program you know by doing that. So to wrap up here, give you a chance to talk. How much should Georgia change in light of the the, the new world of college football that we're in? If it wants to compete at the national championship level, I don't think it can change too much. I think you look at the other elite programs um, in, in college football and, and you hear what's coming from them um, and, and what you see from the Alabamas and the Ohio States and Clemson is we might be able to add a piece or two, sometimes three, but really how we're going to build our program is from within through, through high school recruitment. And we want our, our core group of guys to believe in, in the system 
that we've created and the machine that will allow them to maximize their abilities and get them where they want to go. Um, but we're not going to do that by combing through a list of uh, uh, the entire transfer per- portal and trying to create an opportunity to, to just bring in um, a, a vast majority of the guys that can help us out. I, I think you're looking at position specific needs. If there's, you know, a handful of guys, you know, like what we saw with uh, Kendrick this past year and Smith and, and being able to add them late in the transfer transfer portal season um, and, and see if we can address some specific needs and how they fit in our system. Um, but you're not going to just totally uh, identify yourself as a, a transfer uh, destination and expect to have um, the culture, the identity, the quality that these top programs have when they establish everything from in-house. I think you're looking at adding to it but not making it your primary source, um, which is the, the same expression that's being made uh, you know, there was recently an article from Dabo Sweeney saying, you know, we might need to consider blowing this whole thing up. And uh, you look at the direction of NIL and transfer portal, and I think the two work hand in hand. And it's a much, much different model of college sports, specifically college football, than what it was, let's just call it five years ago. Uh, the landscape has changed so much that they're barely, uh, identifiable as, as the same creature even. Um, and uh, it's probably the same could be true uh, five years from now when you look at where, where college football is just based on, you know, I was listening to you earlier talk about the comparison between uh, college football players and college coaches and that, well, they can transfer. Well, they're also under contract. Yeah. And uh, if, if you want to be treated uh, like an NFL player, which is, you know, we, we you have contracts, which there's a heck of a lot more restrictions on NFL players now, it seems like, than there are for college players and their ability to pick up and move and, and transfer when things uh, aren't, aren't to your liking. Um, th- there's not near the amount of control uh, in the NFL level. When you've signed a contract and you know, let's say you're on a rookie deal, most teams can lock you in for five years. And that's just not the case, nor is it the model for college football. But to be honest with you, BA, I don't know what that model for college football is right now. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, uh, with the ability to, for players to, to receive payment and, you know, we can act naive and say that that's not tied to a specific university, but that's, hogwash i mean guys are going to specific places and part of that is understanding their marketability when you have long snappers making five figures for playing at a particular university and the, and the marketing deals that that are availed to them then that matters and you, you can only extrapolate out what that means to uh more prolific uh positions and and, and the exposures that they might receive at a given university.